Welcome to the Beanstalk Twitter space. So here's the deal. Beanstalk is a sponsor of Black Report, which is my website slash blog slash whatever you want to call it. And actually is a sponsor of all the work that I do because it's all related back to Black Report. So Beanstalk contacted me, <clears throat> Beanstalk um, Farms, I have to get the terms right, contacted me um, last month, I guess it was, and said, we love what you do and we want to support it. And I said, great, um, you can support it. I would love for you to support it, but that means I have to, in order to maintain my integrity, I have to turn around and do a report on Beanstalk. And the idea is that um, that report is independent of the sponsorship. I did this before with Threshold Network and TBTC. That report is up already on Report, And my aim is to have a similar style report for Beanstalk. So the idea is that the, the any money is separated from the content of this report. The report is not sponsored content. Uh, Beanstalk has no um, editorial control <laughs> or anything like that over it. Uh, there's no amount of money they could pay me that would pay for my opinion. And I've spent three years in this space to try to prove that to everyone. Um, so that report's going to come whether these guys like it or not, as much as I respect you guys, it's, you know, you can't not have that report up at this point, that report's coming. Um, and there's no guarantee that that Beanstalk's going to like it. It's not to say it's automatic negative, you know, it's, it's going to be honest, it's going to be accurate. And I hope that it turns out to be helpful to the team and to users. That's my goal. Um, so with that being said, thank you guys for joining. Um, I know, um, Publius is like multiple people, right? And you guys are the developers. We're the founders. We're a small part of the team that is currently developing Beanstalk at this point. Okay, great. <clears throat> um, and I know we also have Guy and we have... Uh, I think that's it, right? Did I add everybody I need to add? I think we're all set. Okay, cool. So here's how... I'd like this to go. Um, this is like a kickoff call for me as I research the project. Obviously, I've done some research already. Um, but this is like, you know, for me, like the mental kickoff as far as really getting into it and exploring. And, and my goal is ultimately to figure out what are the questions that haven't been asked yet? And what are the really important questions that we need to be thinking about with regard to who do we have to trust in order to use this? You know, if we get to the answer is nobody, then that's great. I would love that. But in the meantime, I want to get to the bottom of who do we have to trust? Do we have to trust anybody's skill? Do we have to trust anybody's integrity uh, in order to feel like money deposited into this protocol is safe? And, um, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that. But can you, um, does anybody have like a, I know it's easy to, to explain this protocol and like, 10 minutes but does there anybody have a good like two minute like elevator pitch as far as like what is beanstalk so anybody want to take a stab at that well <laughs> i know it's hard <laughs> i think it's worse than that it's that like we're not fans of the elevator pitch because it almost like you know the goal is not to have people take a quick look at this it's very complicated and it's hard to get people to it's hard to think that the optimal like long-term strategy uh, when it comes to like attracting the right community to Beanstalk in its early stages to have a great elevator pitch, but nonetheless, we will try to do our best. So, all right. So what is this? Somebody asked you like, what is Beanstalk? Yeah. All right. Well, we'll say? still, we'll, 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 we'll honor, we'll honor your question, Chris. Uh, you're, you're the host. <laughs> so we'll, we'll do our best to, to let you steer the ship here. So, uh, Currently, I think ev most people would agree with the value proposition of uh, censorship-resistant uh, cryptocurrency money. And currently, Bitcoin and Ether, the two by a wide margin leading censorship-resistant cryptocurrencies, the monetary policy of those currencies have clearly been designed around a hard money uh, store of value thesis. 
which are highly deflationary. And fundamentally, from an economics perspective, uh, deflationary currencies uh, have lost out to inflationary currencies uh, in history. And if you view uh, the markets as sort of one of the or the primary guiding force uh, in the evolution of money over the past couple of thousands of years, then you sort of have to implicitly accept that deflationary money has generally lost out to inflationary money or more, more than just inflationary money, low volatility money to be more specific. And so uh, people talk about a stable coin, but what, what is really being worked on is a low volatility monetary asset that has endogenous value because of its low volatility. And so Beanstalk is an attempt at issuing a different type of cryptocurrency that is uh, based on the same principles or very similar principles uh, to both Bitcoin and Ethereum uh, in terms of censorship resistance and uh, open access uh, and open access to development. Uh, so Beanstalk is designed to be a base layer issuer of money but the type of money that it issues is fundamentally different than a hard money, uh, limited supply based type of value. Okay, gotcha. So, like the website says, permissionless fiat stablecoin protocol, but you're telling me something a little different. Like it, the goal, the the peg is to one dollar, right? Uh, correct. Okay. But what you're saying is that it's it's not ultimately designed to be a stable coin? Is that right? Well, what it means is that the value that it beans are pegged to or an implementation of beans is pegging the value of beans to need not be a dollar. It could be uh any, you know, unit of value in theory that can be measured. So it could be an index of value uh, there could be an attempt to have a Bitcoin, uh, a Bitcoin pegged version of Beanstalk. Uh, now, not all pegs are created equal, meaning having beans, beans are fundamentally debt of Beanstalk. Uh, and because of that, the denomination of debt is very important when it comes to the sustainability of the system. So denominating debt in an asset that is highly deflationary like Bitcoin is a lot riskier than denominating the debt in something like U.S. dollars, which is generally inflationary. So at the end of the day, the market may decide that the optimal value to have beans pegged to is some index of uh, value that is more abstract than the U.S. dollar. But currently, the market in general has massive demand for us dollars and therefore that's where uh it seemed to make the most sense to have bean stock start okay so what i'm hearing is that it, as opposed to other stablecoin projects that count on their peg being stable like always being one dollar bean stock is being designed to track an asset that can have a moving price but it would track it in a low volatility way against that moving price. Is that right? Well, both things are true, right? Like the value of a dollar has volatility in and of itself, right? So the question is, what is the value? Well, the value can be denominated in whatever asset you choose. And then there's separately a question as to how does Beanstalk maintain a stability or relative stability to whatever that denomination of value is. And in the case of Beanstalk, it doesn't make any sort of explicit promises as to the value of beans. And instead, as you suggested, maintain, tr attempts to uh, limit the volatility or the deviation from the peg, but doesn't make any sort of explicit promises about the price of a bean ever. Okay, I, I'm just trying to make sure I have this right because 
the price of one dollar in dollars doesn't change. Like stable coins don't track buying power; they track the dollar. But but bean stock is capable well, stable, of well, tracking. Well, a stable coin could track anything, right? A, a current stable coin, anything with a stable price. Well, what is a stable price? Okay, so so a stable coin could track one Bitcoin, and one Bitcoin will always equal one Bitcoin. Correct. Okay, so it can. Okay, so so uh, bean stock could track like Tesla. One share of Tesla stock could be a bean, and bean stock wouldn't need to know the price of the stock. In theory, in theory, bean okay. stock would need to know the price of the stock. But the point is, the bean, beans are like a debt of Beanstalk. Beanstalk is fundamentally a credit-based system, which is uh, okay. n- n- new or novel to the to the blockchain world generally. And so the, the denomination of the debt of Beanstalk, the smart contract, can be anything, right? You need an oracle to denominate the value of the debt, but that oracle could be anything. So even though beans are pegged to the value of a dollar uh there is an oracle that actually has to derive the value of beans in dollars if that makes sense and in fact an assumption that the oracle... you. can you hear me yeah you're back now so you said there's an oracle that has to derive what the value of beans in dollars Right, from the open market. Okay. And that you. oracle has to determine what is the price of a dollar. So a, an issue with the oracle uh, is that it, is, it, it, it bases the value of beans relative to three curve, which is where all of the cr- liquidity currently trades. And when there was the USDC DPEG uh, recently, because DAI is mostly USDC, uh, and USDC and DAI then became most of the pool. Uh, in practice, the value of a dollar that beans were pegged to, which was derived from the value of three curve, uh, the virtual price of three curve to be specific, uh, was inaccurate uh, in practice. So it's like the value of what beans are pegged to can be theoretically a dollar, but practically needs to be answered more you know, specifically. So the concept is what beans are pegged to at a high level and what beans are actually pegged to in practice, you know, are, are, are almost two different questions. And from that perspective, the model can okay. peg beans to anything. Okay. Okay. I got you. So before we get into like the mechanics, cause I know that's going to, it gets complicated a little bit. Um, I just want to understand the history a little bit. So would you call this version two of Beanstalk? Uh, I think the white paper does like it say was the 2.0, new... so it would probably be fair to call it 2.0. Okay. Um, you know, don't think that the economics of Beanstalk were fundamentally up- updated uh after the exploit, although uh, this version of Beanstalk is significantly more permissioned than the last version of Beanstalk, uh, which was ultimately its undoing uh, in practice, uh, was the totally permissionless governance. And so while the general, our our hope certainly, uh, which we've been very public about, and our general understanding of consensus within the community is that there's a very high desire to move back as quickly as is safe uh, or, or or as quickly and safely as possible might be a better way to say it uh, back to an entirely permissionless system of governance. Uh, it's, it's not going to be so easy. So yeah, maybe that's the best bifurcation between a 1.0 and a 2.0, uh, which is unfortunate, but it is the reality. Okay. So uh, for those that don't know, last year in April, there was a 70-something million dollar exploit of Beanstalk. Um, 
that was the result of a governance attack. So the the exploit that happened was completely my understanding of it is it was completely related to the governance side. It was not at all related to the um, to the mechanics of the protocol itself. Is that accurate? Well, the mechanics of the protocol include governance, so it's hard to be like totally explicit. But the short answer is that the economics from a peg ma- from a I peg mean. maintenance perspective from a core, like what is the model around issuing debt-based uh, and credit-based uh, money, was that working economically? Yes, that up until the exploit was doing quite well in our opinion. Uh, but obviously, or maybe not obviously, Beanstalk is a type of system where anytime you have credit, uh, in theory, uh, you you could go bankrupt at any moment. Where if you become uh, like the fundamental assumption that users of Beanstalk or, or users of Beans are making uh, is that Beanstalk will remain credit worthy for the period of time in which uh, people are using the Beans, and what that what that means in practice is that Beanstalk will be able to borrow from the open market. Uh, over time but but the point is that beanstalk can become viewed as not credit worthy by the market at any time and that may be temporarily or that may be permanently and if it becomes permanently viewed as not credit worthy uh, at any price uh, or any sustainable price at that point beanstalk could become uh, you know could collapse and so the, the, the <clears throat> fundamental question is around whether the credit-based uh, model for issuing money can be sustainable. And while the system was working uh, up until the exploit uh, and, and was quite healthy up until the exploit uh, and was even in its healthiest state ever at the time of the exploit, effectively uh, – in its in its brief nine month history up until then, uh, there there is still like a fundamentally open question as to whether or not the the this type of model uh, can work at all, uh, and if it can work at all, whether Beanstalk is a sufficiently uh, strong or quality model to fulfill the ability for a credit based system to uh, issue stable coins and. There's lots of open questions as to, uh, you know, how how to refine the model further at this point. But in terms of those bigger macro level questions around credit, the community has, you know, gone through the the ringer around answering those hard theoretical questions collectively and coming to consensus on why we're all working on this at this point. And uh, yeah, I think feel feel strongly that credit has to have a seat at the table when it comes to creating uh, creating a, a, a crypto economy. Okay. So, yeah, I want to just get, make sure I understand what happened with the exploit. Um, because normally my personal philosophy is there's so many options in this space that once there's a hacker and exploit, uh, I I don't come back, you know, and typically that's because somebody somewhere made a mistake. That's my own personal philosophy. It takes a lot for me to then turn around and give another chance. So I want to understand what happened. So the my understanding of it, just in a nutshell, and correct me where I'm wrong, is that somebody came along and put up a proposal because anybody could make a proposal. Is that right? It was totally permissionless as far as who could... Um, put up a proposal yes okay so somebody put up a proposal uh, for donating funds to Ukraine or something like that but then they hid something in it that ended up um, just robbing the protocol of all the collateral Um, and then they in order to get it 
so in order for it to go into effect, they needed two thirds of the voting power from the Dow. And they got that by getting a flash loan and just using a flash loan to sort of fake the voting power. Well, I wasn't even faking it. It was actually um, a flaw in the, in the governance system that allowed this to happen. And then they were able to execute it only after it sat there for a day, right? It sat there for a day. So I had to go through this delay period uh, before it could get the two thirds to put it into effect. Uh, so nobody caught what was going on in that 24 hour period. And, uh, and then once they did that, they got possession of the 72 million beans, I believe it was something like that, or not the beans, but the, uh, the three curve that was in the liquidity pool because the beans then became worthless. Do I have that mostly right? Yeah, mostly right. Okay. Okay. So when you guys made this a permissionless um, governance system, like what was your, what was your driving force there? Was it, was it, do you have some sort of principles like, development principles around permissionlessness and decentralization and trustlessness or is that is that really where you the point of view you were coming from when you made this such an open system the short answer is yes the longer answer is that Mm -hmm. when so we uh publius deployed beanstalk uh anonymously and Hadn't really told anyone, certainly anyone in the crypto community, uh, about what we were working on. And did that primarily because if Beanstalk is to become the issuer of like a globally adopted money, we don't want to be, you know, there shouldn't be any like seats at the table to make decisions around the monetary policy of the system. The system should have monetary policy that is sufficiently flexible to handle all situations. And there's obviously at the margin opportunities to always improve the model, but the concept that we're going to be involved in that process in perpetuity, uh, is is you know not aligned with the idea of decentralization and censorship resistance because you know we as individuals can always you know uh in theory be co-opted and so even if we would swear our integrity it's like that only goes so far and so the goal of starting the system anonymously was uh to make it clear that we weren't going to stick around and that our like initial contribution of the creation of the system didn't necessarily constitute a finished product. And so there was a future work section in the initial white paper. And to be totally honest, Chris, when we originally deployed Beanstalk, we thought our work was generally done and that the world was going to take it and run with it. And over the next three to six months, it became clear that we, we as individuals, uh, and I guess as, a, as, as founders or as a group of founders, still had a role to play in, in particularly the early development and formation of the economic model, which wasn't as good as we, we, we had drawn up on the big board per se, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, happy to get into the weeds on how that whole open and permissionless system ultimately led to great improvements in the economics of the model and ultimately led to uh, it, it, you know, it, the exploitation of being stuck, if that's interesting. But that's, you know, we, t- to answer your question, we definitely, yeah, when we started the system, the main the main goal of having that open and permissionless governance system was to, was to make it as, as open for anyone to contribute to and participate in as possible. Now it is worth saying that even though Beanstalk is trying to become an issue of money, 
the concept of being a smart contract on Ethereum as opposed to an L1 did present sort of fundamentally different attack vectors. And uh, one of those, uh, uh, the result of that was that there was a need to create uh, an on-chain governance system to facilitate a totally permissionless contribution to Beanstalk as a basis for an economy uh, while taking into the fact into account the fact that Beanstalk would be a smart contract that held value. And as you suggested, Chris, that value is in the form of Ether and 3Curve and LUSD, uh, which just to correct, make a small correction, wasn't collateral, uh, but was liquidity trading against beans that was deposited in the in Beanstalk itself. So uh, that's the you know, that's the short, that's the, I guess, not such a short answer, but that's a relatively short answer. Okay. Yeah, we don't need to get into the weeds on the exploit too much, but really, um, the only other thing I want to ask you about it is what, um, what did you take away from it? Like, it destroyed the protocol initially. I mean, it took the whole thing down. Um, What did you take? Like, what did you learn from that? Are you asking about like from our perspective as like founders, or are you asking about like the, what did the Beanstalk community or the DAO learn and our well, you, interpretation of that? The exploit happened. Yeah, I mean, it happened. You got wiped out, <clears throat> but then you decided to to rebuild. So, what lessons did you take from that for this version that that exists today? Well. There's like the 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 obvious answer, which is that audits and uh, more focus on security are probably better. Uh, Beanstalk had only been audited once by Omnisha up until the the exploit, and it was it had been very hard because we had started it anonymously and. Uh, Beanstalk uh, was only a few months old at the uh, nine months old at the time of the exploit. In practice, it had been very hard to get like, high quality auditors to look at Beanstalk. Whereas after the exploit, that did change. So, like the obvious answer is more security, more focus on audits and stuff like that. Uh, the other obvious answer is that uh, whereas we originally thought. Uh, the, the, the problem to solve was fundamentally an economics problem, which it is. Uh, we really discounted how much of a governance problem there also is to solve here. And as we've since the exploit tried to focus a little bit more on the governance problem, its scope uh, has become clear. And so another lesson, you know, like a punchline lesson is that uh, – the governance problem is not is not so simple. We were quite naive on that front. Uh, when it comes to like more of a like a life lesson, there's an oh, there's a real balance between pushing the limit and you know not overdoing it. And there's a there's a, a real delicate balance there uh, where, where like one or two BIPs uh, were getting pushed, Beanstalk improvement proposals were getting pushed every month. Uh, so like on average up until the exploit, there was like a BIP every two weeks. And on the one hand, pushing new solidity on chain uh, with value in the system is incredibly risky, uh, obviously. But on the other hand, the model was was like not in a very sustainable position from an economics perspective for the first couple of months. And so there was a need uh, regularly to update the economics of the protocol. And from that perspective, there was a, a race against time that had to be considered in addition to potential security risks. And now post-exploit, 
uh, whereas the the economics of the system are in a, in a relatively stable point, and therefore uh, there there's a lot more ability to take a lot of time with each development update to review it and have it audited multiple times, and uh, uh, there can be much. There's a much more uh, there's much more luxury in terms of the capabilities for access to auditors. So that is all wonderful. Uh, at the same time, the life lesson is around like threading the needle between moving fast enough to stay ahead of the curve and sort of protecting what matters most and not, uh, you know, not leaving uh, open like a, a door in the Death Star. And that is, yeah, that's something that it, it, uh, that balance can definitely be further refined. I think, you know, as a community, we're all learning how to do that. And we as founders are learning how to do that. And also as individuals. So it's, it's, it, it was certainly a meaningful, you know, I think a meaningful fuck up for basically every, every, everyone that had participated in the system up until that point and remains a continuous learning uh, point for anyone that is still involved in the system. So it's, uh, yeah, there's a, there's a real balance that everyone is constantly discussing around pushing updates. Right now the price is at 92 cents. There's an update. There are multiple updates to the protocol that could potentially uh, improve peg maintenance. Uh, there's an open question as to how quickly to implement them, how much time to spend scoping them out and specking them out and uh, discussing them before implementing them, how much time to spend auditing them. Is it okay if you know one of these updates goes from taking a month to taking a year in the name of security, or is it better to just push the update? Uh, or what if you push a version one MVP of the update that you can get 30% or 50% of the functionality. So it's a, you know, whereas before uh, the system and the, the risk of the imperfections of the economics of the system uh, made it such that it was a, a lot easier to answer this question uh, in favor of taking a risk to push updates. Now that the economics of the system are, more stable it's a much tougher question to answer so not sure if that's you know if there if there's an explicit lesson there but the lesson continues to be taught every day uh you know if you're, if you're a part of the beanstalk community at least yeah okay now that's good that's good to know and, and hear from you so uh let's talk a little bit about what the use cases are and um, and how this actually works. Um, so, for, I guess first question is what what is the use case? Like, it's the the current implementation is intended to be tracking one dollar. Um, one bean is supposed to equal one dollar, and it's currently at ninety two cents, which obviously is not optimal. What's the who's using this protocol? Like, who is the intended audience? Well, the intended audience in the grand scheme of things is different than like the short term audience, let's call it. And okay. it, 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 in the short term, there, there's only real ability to use beans within the system speculatively, which is unfortunate, but DeFi is just not at a point where it can support uh, real economic activity. And that's something that we got wrong. So why did we start working on Beanstalk? We started working on Beanstalk because we thought the thing that DeFi was missing to really take off was competitive money. So we started working on, you know, what we thought is what we think is competitive money, uh, the, the best money ever made. And it turns out that DeFi is not really ready for, for any act economic activity at all almost so like a micro example of that is that DeFi doesn't support 1155s uh but uh but more generally there's almost nothing you can do other than trade and speculate uh using DeFi at the moment so uh, with, with that said 
what what is the optimal or ideal uh, use or user of beans. So beans are designed to be low volatility money with competitive interest rates. So if you think about where does the what what is money good for? Uh, money is good for uh, transferring uh, or yeah, transferring value across space and time. And there's an open question as to what is the best way to transfer value across space and time. And cryptocurrency as a technology uh, or, or permissionless networks as a technology make transferring value across space uh, much easier. Uh, the, the real question is around transferring value across time. Uh, that's the current open question. And the hard money advocates uh, would say that the best, the best way for money to transfer value across time is for it to increase in value, uh, to be deflationary, such that over time, the value of the money increases as much as possible. And that may be true. The best money, uh, now that the playing field is totally equal and uh, money can be implemented with, with code, with arbitrary rules, and we expect the best rules to be played out over time, that may actually be uh, the case. Uh, that money that is uh, designed to money go up, a number go up, that is the best money. That may be true. However, if you think about it, it's probably not the case. And common sense would tell us that if you're someone that wants to borrow money, uh, do you want to borrow money and denominate the value of your debt in something that is going to go up dramatically or potentially go up dramatically over the course of the loan? Or are you much more likely to be willing to borrow money in, a, in, a, in an asset that is likely to retain a stable value or a relatively stable value over the time period of the loan? And so in addition to value, uh, consistent value or, or the value going up, the volatility of the value is something that is a fundamental consideration of a user, of a business in an economy. So if you, if you consider how much uh, borrowing and lending plays into economic activity, there's a fundamental demand uh, to denominate loans in some sort of uh, value that has lower volatility than something that is designed to go up in value in as many circumstances as possible. And so the just to summarize, the value of uh, the value proposition for a good money, the utility of money is a function of its censorship resistance, its trustlessness. Uh, it's a function of its liquidity, as we were talking about earlier, which is sort of self-explanatory. It's, it's a function of its volatility. Uh, and it's a function of its carrying costs, the, the interest rates. So if all else being equal, uh, you can choose to borrow money uh, in something that has lower interest rates versus something that has higher interest rates, you as a borrower are obviously going to choose something that has lower interest rates. So in terms of uh, the, the, where does the utility of money come from, it's a combination of those four things. And Beanstalk is designed uh, or, or, or is an attempt at optimizing across uh, all four of those parameters. And obviously there are some trade-offs associated with optimizing for each of them, uh, you know, but that's, that's basically the, the high level for where does Beanstalk fit in uh, and where does the utility of beans come from? It's that Beanstalk is designed to create a money beans that is uh, more optimal from a utility perspective 
across those four uh, axes than Bitcoin or Ether or any other cryptocurrency that it, that currently exists or any money that currently exists. Okay, but you you said at the beginning you don't really see it fitting into DeFi today. Is that so? Do you see this more as like a a prototype? Here's the the, for... the problem is like it's a technical implementation problem. So the the way that Beanstalk facilitates uh, a lot of this uh, to happen comes in in the silo, and we can get into some of the weeds at some point if you'd like, Chris. But the concept is that when you, beans are an ERC-20 token, but in order to receive the yield uh, from bean seniorage, so as new beans are minted, they're distributed uh, to every member of the system effectively, uh, uh, or, or you have the potential, uh, if you're a member of the system, to sort of earn a portion of bean seniorage. It's permissionless. Uh, the idea is that you need to deposit your beans which are erc 20s they're fungible in the silo which sort of maps to a bank it's like the beanstalk bank and the beanstalk bank the silo has uh mechanisms that are designed to limit uh bank runs as much as possible beanstalk uh accepts fundamentally that it will because it's permissionless you can come in and come out at any time beanstalk is beans are not collateralized therefore the, the the system will uh, be susceptible to bank runs at any point uh, and in perpetuity. The system is designed to limit the extent of bank runs as much as possible, not prevent them. Uh, the, the incentives around that are implemented in such a way that it removes fungibility. And we can get into all the incentives if you want. But just uh, from a DeFi integration perspective, they're implemented in such a way where it removes the fungibility associated with the beans. So when you deposit your beans in the in the silo, they lose their fungibility. Particularly, there's a time element to when your deposit uh, was deposited, that affects uh, how the deposit is treated in the system. And as a result, th- there's multi-dimensions now to, a, to the deposit. And while that can be implemented as an 1155 token, and uh, believe that is currently in the works. Uh, the point is that DeFi doesn't really support 1155s at the moment. So even if deposits were 1155s, there isn't really widespread DeFi native support for trading and lending uh, 1155s. And so the point is there's a lot of work to be done to facilitate that at this point. Okay. So um, maybe just to wrap it up, I, to, to, I wanna... to, to yeah. to tie the bow on that. So the point is, one of the value propositions of Beanstalk as an issue of currency is that you, the, it's the carry, the interest rates. And the interest rates on beans are potentially very competitive for users because everyone who's holding the beans can er- participate in the seniorage. So when the system prints money, everyone earns the, er- earns the seniorage. You can think of that as like the risk-free interest rate of the system. However, in order to qualify for the risk-free interest rate in the system, you have to forfeit the fungibility. And that has led to a, an implementation issue where it's hard to integrate and compose across DeFi at the moment because DeFi doesn't support 1155s. Okay. Um, all right. Well, that should get fixed in the next year or so, let's hope. All right, let me let me get real with you here because we've got. Have you have you been being through. fake with us thus far, Chris? Let me get real because there's a I, there's a comprehension problem on, on my part. I've been trying. All right, because I still don't really understand. I know we haven't gotten into it on this call, but I don't really understand how this thing works. Um, and but but more importantly, I just I still don't fully understand who who we're trying to to talk to here like who is out there swapping eth for beans like are they doing that just because on um, like i'm looking at the silo on bean.money app.bean.money is the app um and it says 175.2 percent apy so is somebody 
swapping ETH for beans so that they can come here and deposit it and earn that APY. Like I'm, I'm looking at it not from your point of view as the developer, but from the user's point of view. Like who is the user who's coming here and wanting to interact with this? Is it that person who just wants that the high yield? So that's again, unfortunately, that's the only use for beans right now is speculation on you know the the okay. future yield from the system. But the hope would be that what the real user of a, of a bean looks like is that uh, mortgages may be uh, you know, happening through bean stock and denominated in beans, or loans in general can be issued uh, in beans. And the reason for that is, again, like as a money, as a medium of exchange and a unit of account uh, and a store of value, although less of a store of value than something like Bitcoin or Ether, uh, beans are designed to be the best so if you think that the like market is generally efficient at some point it should discover because at the margin businesses that are think about it this way if you have two businesses that are competing and one business denominates some of their transaction in beans and the infrastructure that that runs on is competitive with the centralized infrastructure uh, that they're running on and their competitors are running on the interest from Beanstalk, the seniorage from Beanstalk, that competitive interest rate from Beanstalk should facilitate the, the competitor that is integrating with Beanstalk to outcompete at the margin the competitor that is not. We believe the economics of beans as a currency are, are that compelling, such that businesses that start to adopt it uh, in some capacity will do better than businesses that don't. And the network effect there is very powerful. So the, the main goal at this point is getting to a point where businesses can start to actually use beans for business, uh, both as a medium of exchange mm -hmm. and a unit of account. And in order to do that, there's a lot of DeFi work that needs to be done, if that makes sense, Chris. But currently, yeah. the only, unfortunately, because it's not really easy for a business to create a loan in the system in a practical way, or even really to trade using beans as a medium of exchange, the only, the only short-term value proposition is to speculate on the future value of the system. Okay. Okay. So let's, let's talk about like how things work, but I want to do it slowly and I want to do it, in a way that is understandable by a non-technical person. So bear with me because I, I might interrupt you and it's not to be rude. It's just, you can because... cut me off anytime you want. <laughs> you can cut me off okay. every, every when, minute. When I do, when I make this signal with my hands, you know, to Wh stop, which okay? signal I, I'm it not is... really looking at the you screen. Can't... It's the thing. I'm just kind of, just... <laughs> there's no video, bro. I was, a, that was a test and you failed. Okay. I thought maybe so, I'm not on Twitter this spaces is a, a lot. I thought maybe there's like a hand. I don't know. Sometimes people <laughs> clap. I thought maybe there's like a, a sign you can throw up. I don't know. Oh, here, wait. When I do this. Yeah, no, I'm saying don't that? do that. I'm not looking. I don't want to be looking at the screen now the whole time waiting for you to okay, clap. You. You're calling joking. me off with a clap. Just cut me off. I won't mind. <laughs> okay. W the ways that a new user can interact with this protocol are obviously to buy beans, right? to, to um, deposit into the silo, which is where they would earn some interest rate, um, I believe. What are the other ways that a user can interact with this? Well, there's really two, there's three sides of Beanstalk at the moment. One is the barn, which is like the recapitalization facility. That's not really fundamental to the, the model and it's kind of complicated. So Let's put that to the side. So the, the, and it's also hopefully temporary and one time, uh, and it's designed to fit in as naturally as possible with the other two pieces of the system. So the two pieces are the silo and the field. And the, there's also the sun, which is like the timekeeper of the system, which anyone can permissionlessly participate in by calling the sunrise function at the top of every hour and earning beans for doing so, that's a highly automated and competitive market at this point. So wouldn't recommend a new user start there, but 
for completion would say, you know, you can always call the sunrise. Um, but the point is, if you just want to buy into the system, you can either participate in the silo uh, or the field. Uh, the silo is where you deposit value, uh, whitelisted tokens in the silo to earn future bean mints. And the field is the credit facility of Beanstalk. So uh, again, we were talking before, we said that one of the, or the fundamental assumption that users uh, of beans are making or holders of beans are making is that Beanstalk remains credit worthy. And what that means is Beanstalk will be able to borrow money from the market. So the field is the Beanstalk credit facility where Beanstalk borrows money from the market. So anytime there's an excess of beans in the, in the open market where the price is too low, like right now, Beanstalk tries to borrow beans from the market and, and, and remove them from the supply. It burns them. So it, you can buy beans or uh, create LP tokens that are whitelisted and then deposit those in the silo, or you can buy beans and lend them to Beanstalk in the field. And if you lend bean stock, beans to Beanstalk in the field, you receive pods. And we can get into the economics of pods and the economics of the silo if you want, but the two main ways to participate in Beanstalk are as a depositor or as a lender. Okay, so I'm a lender. I have one ETH. I come to Beanstalk I go to the field. I see the option to sow because everything here is like a farming analogy, which confuses the hell out of me, but I'm, I'm a boomer. So, uh, but I have one ETH. Okay. Or uh, whatever you're you have. You're a boomer, Chris? You come here and young you're a young guy. Yeah, I'm a boomer. Um, I have one ETH, let's say, and or actually in this wallet I'm looking at, I have 0.59 ETH. Which says, okay, you can put in your 0.59 ETH uh, and you will get 102,330 pods. What does that mean? Because that's not beans. These are not something that I can go out and spend, right? What is this? Well, in theory, you could spend anything you want if someone will accept it, right? So never don't say that, but I w don't. But what's the intention? Okay, here? so. Pods are the debt asset of Beanstalk, uh, or the debt of Beanstalk. So the I guess we were also talking about beans are the debt of Beanstalk. It's a complicated system, so don't want to don't want to misspeak. But the concept is, if you sow beans, if you lend your beans to Beanstalk, you receive pods, and the pods pods are a, like a, one of the reasons why. Beanstalk uses a lot of unique terminology is because a lot of the things don't really map to existing things. So pods are sort of like bonds, but they're different in two ways. One, they don't have any sort of maturity date uh, and they never expire. So basically a, a a pod is a zero coupon bond. It doesn't pay any interest. Uh, and you don't know when the pods will become redeemable for beans. But the interesting thing about pods is that the interest rate, well, there's a couple things. One, pods are paid back on a first in, first out basis. So what that means is if you, if you lend to Beanstalk first, you will get paid back first. There's a pod line. So if you lend to Beanstalk now, the pods that you get are at the end of the pod line. The second thing is that the interest rate that you receive, which in Beanstalk is called the temperature, uh, is fixed at the time of the loan. So for every bean that you lend to Beanstalk, the Beanstalk burns, you get uh, pods based on the interest rate, the temperature, at the time of the loan. And then your pods are just in the back of the line waiting to harvest. When they harvest, they become redeemable for one bean a pop. And so the point is that you can, like from a, here's, here's really the, 
the reason for all of these rules. From an economics perspective, Beanstalk wants to create as efficient a market for soil as possible. What is soil? Soil is the willingness to issue debt. So when Beanstalk is willing to issue debt, the goal is to maximize the demand for that debt or maximize the efficiency of the market for that debt. Not necessarily to maximize demand, but maximize demand given the interest rate. So how to create the most efficient uh, incentive mechanism for demand for soil, Beanstalk does it as follows. The fact that there is a line uh, makes it such that there's always a risk that if you wait to lend to Beanstalk, that someone else will get in line in front of you. And the interest rate, uh, the temperature, changes very little every season, uh, particularly now. So the interest rate is something like uh, 8,000 and 9,000 percent right now, and it only changes uh, up to 3 percent every hour. And so the point is, at the margin, uh, the benefit for waiting uh, a little longer uh, to maybe get a slightly higher interest rate has to be weighed against the potential risk of someone lending to Beanstalk before you do. And that marginal risk, uh, maybe a better way to say it is just that risk, uh, creates an incentive to lend to Beanstalk in a relatively efficient fashion. So there are all these rules in the field to create a hopefully as efficient as possible market for lending to Beanstalk. So that's the other way that people can get uh, exposure or participation in in the system is to, to participate in the field. Okay. Let me just make sure I understand. So from my point of view, if I deposit $1,100 worth of ETH, Right now, it would be used to buy eleven hundred dollars worth of beans in this uh, interface here, and then those beans would be sown, which is uh, well, don't don't use the word pods. deposit if you're going to sow because you deposit in the silo, you you lend in the field. So deposit and lend are sort of different. Although I guess you all could right, say I'm a buying... deposit is a loan. You know, it's all semantic. So let's let's try to be a I'm, little. Better. I'm buying beans. I'm buying beans and I'm I'm sowing the beans and then getting pods. But what I'm hearing you say is I can um, take $1,100 worth of ETH and eventually receive $102,000? If, and this is... Because that's what this is telling yeah, you. So right the now. interesting <laughs> thing about the dynamics around beanstalk is that uh, because you know the place in line of your pods at the time that you make your loan, uh, and you know the distribution of bean seniorage to the silo and to the field and to the barn, you can work out the math of exactly when, uh, at what bean supply, your pods will be worth $102,000. And... I think the math currently is that pods at the end of the pod line are assuming a bean supply or will be paid back at a bean supply of something like 1.8 billion beans. So you can think of it as if or at what point the bean supply reaches, again, I'm making up the number, but it's something like 1.8 billion beans. At that point, you your initial loan of $1,100 of ETH should be harvestable for something like $102,000 worth of beans. So basically, it'll never happen. Well, you don't think that right. the supply of beans could potentially reach $2 billion? Do you? Uh, without a doubt. Why, why couldn't it? So you think you're making a realistic claim here that somebody should deposit half an ETH and get $100,000 in the future? Well, let's, let's make a distinction. One, we're not telling anyone what they should do, nor are we making a claim that it, it, it is a good idea to do it. 
Uh, but we are a hundred percent acting in the under the belief that the supply of beans will one day be trillions of beans. Like when we talk about creating new money, Chris, we're not like blowing smoke. We're talking about creating a money that creates value for billions of people. And if a bean is, is – This is how the beans get created, right? This is the process, the pods. Is that the only way beans get created? So it, it, it's a little bit different. So at, at the top of every hour when the sunrise is called, uh, the, the mechanism makes an automatic adjustment to a couple things. It changes – it can mint beans. It can mint soil, uh, meaning it, Beanstalk wants to borrow – uh, beans and it can change the temperature, the interest rate on the soil. And the concept is that when beanstalk mints beans, the beans are uh, paid to pod holders, so pods harvest, and beans are paid to depositors in the silo. Why are beans minted? Beans are minted because there is excess demand for beans, such that the price of a bean over the previous hour was above its peg. Why was there demand for beans? Uh, that's dependent on the specific circumstance. But again, this goes back to the assumption that you're making when you lend to Beanstalk is that at some point there will be demand in excess of 1.8 or 2 billion, you know, we can make it a round number, 2 billion beans. So if you think at some point uh, there's a chance, you know, and that, you know, when it comes to evaluating the efficiency of the the bet you know you have to make your own calculus as to what is the risk adjusted return here so you know you put in eleven hundred dollars you get one hundred and two thousand dollars back what is the chances that you give of uh bean stock getting to two billion beans right so if you think it's more than one and change percent maybe you think it makes sense if you think it's less then it probably doesn't make sense but the point is that Beanstalk as a system is designed to create incentives both to make it very easy for people to do that calculus and come to an expi- explicit you know, evaluation as to what their risk-adjusted return is, and then makes it such that they are incentivized to act as quickly as possible once the risk-adjusted return gets to a point where they are satisfied to, to, you know, and they, they would be happy. So, how are beans created? Uh, the, how bean, would you get to two billion? Beanstalk beans? is a smart contract that can mint arbitrary amounts of beans. So, if there is uh, excess demand for beans, Beanstalk mints beans to meet that demand. So you need demand for beans, in a, but 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 okay, with the pods, it says there's seven hundred eighty nine million in the pod line. Yes, Some, somebody is number one. Right? Yes. So why isn't that person turning their pods into beans? Well, they can't until they become, you know, harvestable, which would be that their 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 number is zero or less than zero. Yeah, so but somebody is zero or one, right? Well, the way it really works is that your pods have an index and then there's a harvestable index. So if you have pods that there, the index on the pods is less than the harvestable index. You can convert your pods into beans, and then you can sell them, you can deposit them, you can lend them, you can do whatever you want. But if your pods have an index that is greater than the harvestable index, they're still pods, and you cannot harvest them. So nobody can harvest pods right now. Well, if you can harvest them, you probably already have. Yeah, I'm just trying to understand, is the line moving? Like, is that number going down? Uh, it could go or up or down. Just, I think is... yesterday someone sewed and, you know, therefore the number went up. But then right now, because the price is below a dollar, there's no beans getting minted. So the number's not moving down. But if the price were above a dollar and beans were getting minted, then the number would go down. Okay. So the harvestable index controls who, whether or not pods can get harvested yeah and it's worth saying like a lot of it seems obvious but it's worth like explicitly acknowledging these are highly reflexive like behavioral systems like we're talking about a system where oh well when there's demand for the system 
it starts to do well, and then there's more demand for the system. So this is like uber reflexive. And this is like the fun. Go ahead. Well, I, when I see a system that has a 9,000% interest rate and is telling me I, I can turn $1,000 into $100,000, um, I see a system where something's not working right. This cannot be the intended way that things are supposed to be going. So what I'm trying to figure we'll out. I'll tell you, we, where... didn't th- we, we never thought. I think there's like an early class for Beanstalk where we were like the, the temperature at that time, I think it was called weather was like maybe it was 17 or 1800%. And I think we're on the record saying like, we don't know if, you know, being stuck can sustain a, a temperature as high as 3000%. Like we did, we don't know. And then up, you know, prior to the exploit, Beanstalk had a peak weather of now it's temperature, but a peak temperature of like, 7,000% or so, and then it, it bottomed out. Now Beanstalk is in new territory when it has an even higher temperature of, you know, I guess you're saying like 9,000. So the point is, it's unclear what the the point becomes where the interest rate that Beanstalk has to pay the marginal lender is so high such that the next lender will never come. Right, if Beanstalk has to pay infinity percent, so you lend or a million a million X, uh, so a hundred million percent, and every bean you lend to Beanstalk, you get a million pods. Now Beanstalk needs to borrow a million beans. That's going to blow out the future implied valuation for lending to Beanstalk, such that it becomes really impossible to justify lending to the system. So at some point, that becomes, you know, and. That question, again, this is the fundamental question around lending to Beanstalk, where you say something's not right. Like right now, to lend to Beanstalk, again, you're assuming that you'll get paid back around a two, the, the contract says you'll get paid back uh, when the bean supply gets to $2 billion. So the market is now pricing, what are the odds that Beanstalk gets to a $2 billion supply? And what we're finding out is that that is currently less than, you know, 1.2 percent let's call it so it may be one percent it may be half a percent uh but the the like from a from a model perspective this scenario is you know it's extreme but these are exactly the types of extreme scenarios that well-designed autonomous monetary policy should be able to handle so it's like you know something's not right as you said but like the thing that's not right is just like, you know, it's a, it's not how you would like, it's not the optimal interest rate that Beanstalk wants to pay. is like 1%, right. Or, or like whatever the, the silo yield is or something like that. So the, the idea that it's paying right. so much is not what it wants, but when it comes to like, are things working? Yeah, this is the way things work. So could they work better? Definitely. Are the things that could be done such that the system is less likely to pay, you know, a 10,000% interest rate on a lot of loans, maybe just one or two? Yeah, like, this is all an experiment that can particularly, you know, governance aside, just on the economics, the economics can continue to be heavily refined and improved. So it's like, this is not you know, to say that it's, it's great, but also don't think that the, like the eye popper, oh my God, I can get a 90 X. Therefore this is obviously a scam or this is obviously like fucked. Um, you know, that's probably not the case either. It's like the system presents a very clear risk return trade-off that, you know, people probably don't know about, to be frank, because we haven't, as a community, spent much time, you know, hooting and hollering about it recently. We've been building some of the stuff to get to a point where hopefully people are not speculating on the future demand of beans exclusively, but also want to use the beans to do stuff. So it's a balance, right? Yeah. So um, a bean by design is supposed to be equal to a dollar, but it's been 
depegging since December. So what's causing that and how do you fix that? Well, what's causing it is that there is more supply uh, entering the market or there, you know, there's less demand for beans. Uh, so there's demand is decreasing. People are selling their beans and the new demand is less than the decrease in demand. So the, the price has come down. Now, normally, Beanstalk tries to borrow beans from the open market in order to reduce the bean supply and return the price to its peg. To your point about the interest rate in the field, the market is not really liking the odds of Beanstalk getting to 2 billion beans. It says you have too much debt. Your interest rate is not attractive enough. Uh, And so at the margin, uh, that isn't... Uh, attracting any demand for beans. So what else is there? Beanstalk also has a system within the silo uh, called the convert uh, system. Or I, I don't know if it has an explicit name, but uh, there's this ability to convert uh, in the silo. So you can deposit whitelisted assets in the silo, and whitelisted assets can generally be bifurcated into beans and LP tokens that beans trade against. And conversion is effectively the addition of or removal of beans from to and from liquidity pools. So you go from deposited beans to deposited LP tokens and vice versa. So when the price is too high, uh, you can convert your deposited beans within the silo to deposited LP tokens, which has the effect of decreasing the price. And when the price is too low, uh, you can convert your deposited LP tokens to deposited beans. And that has the effect of raising the price. And currently, the incentives around uh, conversion are static. Uh, Conversions were not an original part of the Beanstalk model, but at this point have demonstrated like a very deep importance to peg maintenance uh, since they were implemented in December of 2021. But nonetheless, the incentives to convert are static. We can get into how they how they work in practice. But the point is that they're not uh, like autonomously changing, like the majority of Beanstalk monetary policy is. And uh, the the there's like a short term change in the works to change the static incentive of the convert incentive. And then there's a larger uh, project that, that you know, it, we are spending time on and uh, other members of the DAO uh, are also spending time thinking about around trying to uh, create a, a system that is not static and is dynamic. Instead, around changing the incentives to convert, to optimize around uh, liquidity, to supply and volatility it's a very complicated thing to optimize around but the point is that over time the you know in addition to the raising the interest rate that beanstalk pays there's another thing that can be done which is refining the incentive for participants that are currently in the system to participate in peg maintenance but and this is a big but it, there's a trade off where the conversions uh, if they happen immediately, it's like Beanstalk guaranteeing a hard peg, if that makes sense. And so there is a question as to leaving it up to the market to convert at whatever price the market wants to convert. But there is an open question as to can Beanstalk change the price uh, or the value of a conversion for a user to make it more or less attractive to do so? So that's like where this is heading mm-hmm. from a model refinement perspective. Okay. So, um, well, why isn't this working? Like, why is it? Why we is would it argue it is working. Like, it's not working because it's supposed to be a dollar and it's been gradually depegging since December. So, well, it depends what you mean by why work, isn't it right? So, dollar. It's supposed to be a dollar, right? Yeah, but I think that's that's sort of disingenuous, right? Like. To, what? to 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 work well for you to say like it has to be a dollar to be working to work is 
is dependent on what is the challenge that has been set forth. And Beanstalk, much more than prioritizing a hard peg, prioritizes not going bankrupt. And if you look at every other non attempt at a non-collateralized stablecoin, there has never been a non-collateralized stablecoin, whether it's debt-based, equity-based, uh, no matter how big or small it's been, that has ever depegged for an extended period of time in a slow and steady fashion like Beanstalk has. So even though it is depegged and the price is at 91 cents and change, just under 92 cents, and it's not at its dollar peg, it's also been pretty low volatility. So it's the, the, the volatility in the grand scheme of things to what we were just talking about can definitely be further refined through further improvements to the incentive structure uh, of the mechanism. Well, that's but like because you just laid out like a bunch of incentives and the whole design is supposed to bring the price back up over time. to a dollar. Like, right. Oh, but right. OK, but why is it not working? We just like, ex- not we just explained it's- it like the the marginal incentive to lend to the protocol right now at a 90 X uh, the market is not viewing that as an attractive trade-off. And so it's taking time for Beanstalk to raise the interest rate to a point where the market will view it as attractive. And separately, the sep- the second way that it could repeg, which would be that uh, users in the silo are converting the price or the value, the incentives at the margin to convert right now are not uh, set in such a way where those participants are incentivized to convert in practice. So the there's an open question. Is the, is the interest rate, should it be raised higher? Should it be raised uh, faster? The 9,000? The 9,000% That's what, what should be higher? Well, I, we, we don't think so. We're just, you know, we're, we're, we're explaining to you like what, what's going wrong. Well, you could say, well, you need to pay a higher interest rate. We would argue that's probably not the case. And the, so we would argue that the way that the temperature is increasing, given that there's no demand at 9,000%, hard to imagine there's a ton of demand at 10,000% or 11,000%. So it doesn't seem like the protocol is going to be able to attract lenders in the short term. So therefore, it's like, well, what is, how can the system improve itself other than that and still be like defensible, it's through conversions. Mm -hmm. And so the the problem with conversions, you're saying, why doesn't it work? Why isn't it working? It's not at a dollar because no one wants to lend in the field and the people in the silo don't want to convert. So the, 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 the point though is when you say working, well, not working from our perspective would be to collapse, to be at zero. Uh, but it is collapsing. It's gone it's from a dollar to ninety one. This is what a collapse looks like. We we I I, I mean I, if, I mean <laughs> we've seen a if you look we've at the seen a lot of December. collapses between now and uh, December, Chris. Right? We've seen a lot of major financial institutions collapse between now and the the, the last time beans depegged. Yeah, but what I'm getting at is it's on a steady downward trend for months and. It doesn't sound like there's any plan to stop. What do you mean? We trend. just at, we just laid out, out a full plan. There's all these work 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 in progress to change the incentives around conversions. That's all going to happen in the next couple months. So how? Okay, so we've got ten minutes left. So we're um, doing good here. I love. Thank this. you for for. Well, yeah, I appreciate you jockey jo- joshing with me or what's the good word joshing is good. jockeying with jo- me joshing here. is good um, we're just joshing here we're jockeying jousting we're jousting. jousting we're doing all of the above um we're having fun certainly how do those changes now you've you used to have a permissionless governance system so now you you don't how does it work now with with changes to the protocol so there's there's two separate things here one is who owns the smart contract and then separate is who can uh, upgrade the contract. So Beanstalk has always been owned by like not the null address, if you will. So originally we owned it. Uh, now it's owned by the BCM, the Beanstalk Community Multisig. Uh, but the point is Beanstalk as a contract is owned by some address that uh, has, uh, if you will, executive authority over the contract. Now, with that said, there 
there there used to be a way for the DAO to permissionlessly upgrade the contract. Now, uh, whereas the DAO can still vote on upgrading the contract, the actual execution of the upgrades is currently permission. So those upgrades are implemented by and permissioned by the BCM, the Beanstalk Community Multisig. Happy to happy okay. to get into so all the, the weeds the, if you want, and also have Guy here who is like, you know, a, a real expert on all the nitty gritty on how the governance stuff works. If you want to get into any the weeds. DAO, um, the DAO votes on snapshot or something. Currently, yes. Okay, and then so it's like a ceremonial um, signal to the multi sig to to do something, and then the multi sig has to agree to do it. I think if you want to be like the most cynical about it, yes, you could say it that way. But how is that cynical? Well, it's not really a ceremony; it's a process, right? So, being if you think about like credit as a social phenomenon, users of Beanstalk are subscribing to some sort of set of rules. The set of rules of which include, you know, if some—I mean, you can call it a ceremony—but if some vote takes place to perform upgrades to the contract that some participants in the system that have those permissions will fulfill their duty in the system to upgrade the system. So it's like the concept of not doing that would be to violate the like integrity of the credit of the system or certainly uh, threaten. You could. Yeah, you of could, course you, you could. could not it's not permissionless. Yeah. But I st- I, we're actively acknowledging that. I'm just commenting that I think the, the connotation yeah, of it yeah. being ceremonial is a little bit cynical, but recognize that in practice there is a gate or a lever that does need to be pulled. But then the question is, well, who's pulling the lever? And at this point, the lever is being pulled by, I believe it's a five of nine multi-sig, uh, the members of which are distributed across contributors, community members, and uh, we Publius have a key. So it's pretty distributed and, uh, feel like while while it is very important to acknowledge like it's permissioned it is not a system that is permissionlessly upgradable uh it's also a system that would be compromised deeply by having any sort of you know action by the bcm that was uh against the act of the 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 dow act against the will of the dow and so it's like you know, again, just put really here, just pushing back on the concept of it being ceremonial. It's like, it's far from perfect, but it's not a ceremony. It's like, this is actually happening. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a signal. The snapshot vote is a signal, a request to the multi-sig. It's a request. And then the multi Right. And then the multi-sig signers can decide whether or not to do it. hundred percent. So, um, and you said it's a five of nine. Um, and is the, is the um, the multi sig basically have full upgrade powers over all the correct relevant contracts? every piece of beanstalk can be upgraded. Okay, and it is worth saying so the multi-sig- that like mm-hmm. fundamentally, because beans can be minted uh, arbitrarily through an upgrade, that like there's no additional protections or limitations to upgrading beanstalk that can really matter. If you know what it mean, if you know what I mean, like because you could mint a trillion beans and drain the whole system of uh, uh, the whole value from the system, uh, you know it doesn't matter if you impose restrictions on what the the owner can do. It's like if you give them the authority to mint beans, you know, right? That's kind of like you're you're already making a deal with the devil. So it's like, well, if we do that, now you got to just take whatever you you know it doesn't matter right does it utilize a, a, a time lock contract of any sort uh for the minting no but no the admin multi uh for the upgrades to the contract uh do yeah, not believe right. so because in the instance where there are critical bugs uh the the idea is that they should be removed as quickly as possible potentially and, and, okay, so the multi and posting can make posting like the upgrades mm-hmm. somewhere for a period of time before the upgrades are committed can be an issue if there's a bug. 
Right. Yeah. There's that trade off. On the flip side, the multi sig can make any unilateral changes that it wants. Hundred um, percent. And that is something that is disclosed. Being... There's a disclosure statement somewhere. Um, that is something mm-hmm. that's openly disclosed by the DAO. Okay. Um. Yeah. I mean, it becomes more relevant, you know, now that we're getting into situations where, like, courts are ordering devs to use their multi sig to, you know do stuff or freeze funds or, you know, like with, like with Oasis, I don't know if you follow that whole story. Totally. Um, so it becomes, um, that was properly implemented. People could have, um, but anyway, uh, final, like couple minutes. Um, Oh wait. Yeah. In our final couple minutes, um, we talk about the oracles fast um where are you using oracles now and what are those oracles where is where is that data coming from well there's hello there's two can ah. you hear me yes there, there, there's there's two answers one is there is currently a bean three curve pool that beanstalk derives the value of a bean relative to a dollar from three curve and the bean three curve pool. Um, And there is a future case where Beanstalk, uh, uh, we've been working with members of the Beanstalk Dow and Beanstalk Farms on a new uh, DEX architecture that has composable uh, oracles and uh, pricing functions such that the there, there's a major problem in the pro post uh, merge era around multi-block MEV. And so basically there's a, an arbitrary cap that is pu- uh, on, put on the bean three curve curve Oracle uh, because of the potential risk to multi-block MEV. And so there's currently an, uh, a, a new Oracle called pumps that are in development to pump the data from the wells where the liquidity is being traded uh, into Beanstalk or anywhere else that needs the data in a way that is resistant to uh, multi-block MEV. So that's the, the current state is the bean three curve pool, but the future state is going to be uh, from the pumps. And there is then an open question with, let's say we have a bean ETH pool. Well, what is the price of ether in dollars? And so then there is still an like an existential oracle question as to how to value ether or any other asset in whatever beans are pegged to. And there's an open discussion happening in the DAO right now around whether to use the ETH USDC Uniswap pool, which isn't multi-block MEV resistant, uh, whether to use the chain link price. Uh, there's a lot of open questions there. So, uh, you know, over time, the hope would be that more and more of DeFi migrates to uh, the pumps Oracle style, such that there's composable liquidity on chain. And then even like the uh, ETH uh, USDC Uniswap liquidity could be uh, used uh, relatively safely within Beanstalk and other protocols, as opposed to right now, uh, you know, the fact that Chainlink is even being considered says a lot. Yeah, agreed. It's a tough problem. Uh, okay. We've, we've like, we, well, li- great. we try so, to live and die by the on-chain Oracle. So it's like, you know. Well, that's, that's great. That's good to know. We have died in the past that due to that. So take it for what it's worth, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> it literally, yeah. Um, back from the dead. Um, all right, cool. Well, we're up against the clock. So listen, um, I greatly appreciate you hanging with me, answering my questions, um, being transparent about things. That's the most important value to me in this space. So thank you for that. Is there anything like just wrapping up that you want known or, um, that you think was not fairly represented in this call or you feeling pretty good? Well, we, we, just want like you know I, at the beginning of the call you're talking about you know how you're going to take a good hard look at this thing you know it almost sounds like you're a proctologist like you're coming to give a prostate exam to beanstalk 
And we just wish Beanstalk would have more prostate exams. Like we don't feel like people have done the work on this thing. And it's because it's very complicated and it is what it is. But we are really grateful that you're willing to spend the time to get into the weeds and would really just ask that as you, you know, really get into the nitty gritty uh, and you come across things that you don't understand or seem off, like ask and feel free to ask publicly, like, hey, this doesn't make sense to me. We love the public discussion and discourse. We want more people to ask the questions that are on your mind, because if they're on your mind, they're probably on other people's minds. So it's like, we want to create an environment where it's almost like, you know, being forced to do your diligence and ask the questions about what's going on here. You know, it, it, it's like, you have to, you have to do you ha- like Beanstalk. Just, we want it to be an environment where people have to do their homework and are, are you know, want to just, you know, say thank you for you doing your homework and encourage you to, you know, do your homework. And then maybe we do another one of these, uh, in a little while where you come up with, hey, here's what I don't like, here's what I don't understand, and give us a chance to to talk about it. Yeah, sure. I don't know about the, the finger in the butt analogy, but yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying and appreciate it. And, and by the way, just a reminder that Beanstalk asked for this conversation, you know, so well, you know, you've got to get your prostate exam, <laughs> uh, right? I think that's the... There's no fucking prostate exam. I'm not sticking my finger to any asses, uh, dude. I don't know. This is, this you is should go a... back and listen to that. When this recording drops, you should go back and listen to it, and you'll know what I'm talking about. <laughs> You're like, you can, you can hear the glove snapping at the beginning. You're like, yeah, okay, I'm getting ready. Here's my, here's my thing. The gloves are snapping. So, no, all right, no. we're just having fun here. All right, hey. This is more like a... a... <laughs> This is like a, a really bad Tinder date, you know, like it's it's gone terribly wrong. But I don't know, man, you know, we try not to talk on the Tinder dates about uh, or any dates for that matter about this stuff. They tend not to be uh, <laughs> very interesting. So, uh, yeah, or therapy. Take... This could also be therapy, you know, like, you know, getting it all out on the table. Honest, brutal well, answers. We, we, but you want to get to the real whatever. stuff, Chris, we're going to have to be doing a lot more of these Twitter spaces. So. <laughs> you know what, man? Come up with a farm analogy for it, and that'll be a real – that's on brand, right? Sounds like fun. So, <laughs> all right. Listen, thank you again. Thank you, Guy, and everybody else at Beanstalk. And thanks, everybody, for listening. And we'll be back soon. Have a great day, guys.